Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopez and today my guest is Dr. Robert Kurzban. He is a former professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on the nature of evolved cognitive adaptations for social life. He has also served as both the editor-in-chief of the, of the journal sorry, Evolution and Human Behavior and president of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. And he's also the author of the books Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite and The Hidden Agenda of the Political Mind. So, Dr. Kurzban, welcome to the show. Thank you a lot for, for accepting the invitation. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so to start off with, we're going to talk about today a lot about, of course, the modular approach to the human mind. And I guess that there are people with different approaches as to what uh, cognitive modules are. So could you please start off by giving us your view about it? Yeah, so a uh, great question. So my view, which is, is shared by some of my friends in evolutionary psychology, Ecology, uh, is that when we talk about modules, what we're really talking about is functional specialization. So um, a computational system that's good for a narrow task. And your question is interesting because, of course, historically, some people have used the word differently. Um, and some people, of course, also think of it in a spatial sense, so occupying a particular position. Um, but for us, the key feature is that, that it's a, a system in your head that does a specific job. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, and I already talked, for example, with people like Dr. Lida Cosmides, and he's also, and she's also very connected with the notion of the modularity of the human mind. And th that's why I asked you, because, for example, in our interview, we talked about uh, how modularity was first introduced, I think, by the philosopher Jerry Fodor. And the, uh, Dr. Cosmides didn't agree with the approach that he had back then in the 80s or something like that when, when he said that, for example, uh, modules would be encapsulated, that is, they wouldn't share information with one another. But you also don't agree with that approach, correct? Well, sure. So, of course, Lita Cosmides is my former advisor, so it's not a coincidence that we share similar views. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, Clark Barrett and I, who have written a little bit about this, although it's some time ago now, you know, we take the, the view that um, if you have these modular systems, then the question about what information they get as inputs or what information they get as outputs and they share, that those are empirical questions, that we don't want to say that those are definitional. That's how you figure out if it's a module. We want to say, well... You know, um, by and large, many of these things might have some specialized sorts of inputs and they might have really narrow ways in which they share information. But we take that to be an empirical question, something that we're figuring out about the mind, not, not something that we assign to the definition of a module. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the way you look at its module is as it being uh, an adaptation of our mind that is, for example, if during our evolutionary history we had to deal with or tackle a certain specific problem, then the mind, let's say, phenotypically evolved to have a certain specialization to deal exclusively with that specific problem. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is an area where I think Fodor should be given credit because you can see this very easily at the systems that he spent time talking about, like the visual system. So, you know, you've got these, this retina and its job is just to look for, you know, just to be sensitive to the visible spectrum and to build an image so you can see the world. Um, and that's clearly an adaptation, in this case, designed to um, see, see the world, to, to have a visual experience. Um, and, and so that's what we would expect. The only thing I would add to your question is that, of course, um, adaptations, they, they don't exist in a vacuum, right? So the environment is necessary for them to, to develop into their normal everyday phenotype. I think that's a very important piece to, to, to always remind, remind people about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so according to the evolutionary theoretical approach to the mind as composed of cognitive modules, it doesn't really make sense to talk about a self, 
Well, that's my view. Um, I think other people might have a different view, but I certainly think I, I at least want to say that it's very it's problematic to talk about there being a self. And I think part of the reason it's important not to do that is because it defends against making certain kinds of mistakes as if there's one little guy in your head who's sort of the smart piece of your mind that's doing all the hard work. Um, you know, I like drawing on the the work of Marvin Minsky, the artificial intelligence researcher, who, you know, I think he was one of the first people to think seriously about how having lots of different parts can make you intelligent as opposed to having one central super part, smart parts. And, and so, yeah, I, I do think it's sort of problematic. If you, if you take the view that all the mind is is a bunch of different parts, then um, it just might not be that there's anything that we would call the self that, that's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this, this has some implications as to how we look at ourselves and even other people. So, for example, if our mind is composed of these specializations, let's say, uh, they operate mostly at the subconscious level, correct? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I, I think that in, here's another case where it's important to give credit to the prior thinkers, people like Freud and so on. Um, yeah, there's so much going on in your brain. There's so many systems that are keeping track of, you know, the, the autonomous nervous system and the visual system and uh, the languages that most of these things, you know, we have no conscious awareness of. And so what that implies is that the, the, the conscious parts, the, the parts that give rise to qualia, to experience are just a very small fraction of all the different things that are going on. And, uh, that's important to remember, uh, because, you know, when we're, in, when we're asked to introspect about what's going on in our mind, the, you know, we, we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily know the, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and is it because uh, these things operate mostly at the subconscious level that when people are, are asked, for example, to explain why they performed a certain action or, or why they did a certain thing or why they behave toward another person? person in a certain way that they usually um, what they can do is give us sort of a post hoc rationalization because they don't really have direct access to how things are operating uh, in their minds. Right. Yeah, completely. And again, uh, you know, Mike Zanica has done some work on this. They're talking about the interpreter. Um, and you know, I think it's really important. So what that means is that, you know, there's systems in your brain that are causing your behavior, your beliefs, and so on, and if the conscious mind doesn't have access to them, well, then you can't give sort of a true answer about what, you, what your true motives are, uh, and then often you have to just uh, kind of confabulate, make things up. Uh, and then there's a question about how often, you know, we, we know and how often we don't. Uh, I take the, the view that it seems, at least to me, uh, we almost, we, we very frequently don't know the, the, the reasons that lie behind our behavior, the true motives that give us our opinions and actions. And that wouldn't be surprising if there's all this unconscious stuff do, doing its work sort of behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there's those interesting experiments that people did some decades ago with split brain patients and i think th those are important to um, for people to better understand this notion about people not really having access to things that operate in their brain so could you talk a little bit about that yeah so these are some um, studies done with people who have had the two sides of their uh, brain they, they have the connection separate so the right brain can't talk to the left left brain um, and so again, this is Xanaga's work. So he had people perform a certain uh, task where they see a, an image very briefly on a screen, and the the person is asked to point to pictures that are associated with those two uh, scenes. But the thing is that the right hand is pointing to a picture, the left hand is pointing to a picture, um, but the whole brain, uh, the brain as a whole, doesn't know why each hand points. It only knows the answer to one question, like which which. Uh, and it controls why it pointed to that picture. And so when the experimenter asks why they pointed to those two images, the subject, because it's got a split brain, it simply doesn't have access to part of the information, it just has to make things up. And this is super important because it illustrates that um, under those circumstances, albeit you know, an unusual circumstance with, with a patient, um, you know, the, the people don't say, well, I don't know. What they do is they just make up a motive, even if, the, if that part of their brain doesn't have access to it. It's super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, it's really interesting. And now to get a little bit more directly into uh, your first book, that is why everyone else is a hypocrite. Uh, at a certain point in your book, uh, 
you state and now I'm going to quote, in fact, being ignorant, wrong, irrational and hypocritical can make you much better off than being knowledgeable, correct, reasonable and consistent. As long as you're ignorant, wrong, irrational and hypocritical in the right way. So could you explain what you mean by this and perhaps uh, the concept of being strategically wrong? Yeah, great. So all of those have to do with strategy. So the key point here is that when when people are interacting in the social world, it's important that it's the social world. Um, there's going to be ways in which these kinds of errors can be a strategic advantage. Let me just give you a couple of examples because I think they illustrate the general point. So, you know, I live here in Philadelphia and in the book I talk about how here in Philly, if you're crossing the street and you make eye contact attack with a driver, the driver knows that you might, you know, try to get out of the way if he barrels through the intersection, which they do here uh, frequently. But if you don't make eye contact with the driver, if you look down or away, then the driver knows that you haven't seen them. And so they tend to slow down because they don't want to hit you, right? You can't get out of the way. So there, when you're playing a game with the driver, and that's basically just a game where there's different outcomes, right? Um, you have an advantage by not knowing that the driver is coming. So this is an advantage of ignorance. Um, one, one kind of example that uh, the famous psychologist William James likes to use in terms of um, being wrong is and this has spawned literature on self-deception, which I think you might also be asking about, uh, is how if you have the, an incorrect belief about yourself, particularly a favorable belief about yourself, that can influence other people's behavior, right? So you know more about you than anyone else. If you think you're wonderful, other people don't have all the data you have. They're like, okay, well, maybe he's wonderful. So there's a strategic advantage in the context of persuasion. So everything um, that has to do with having these false beliefs is going to somehow turn on changing other people's behavior through some kind kind of strategic advantage, some kind of persuasive ability. Mm -hmm. Exactly. O okay, so we've been talking about these things that go around in people's brains or minds that they are not really aware of. Um, so, th And they are also not aware specifically of how their uh, decision-making cognitive processes operate, right? So, so uh, on that basis, does it, does it still make sense to talk about things like, for example, uh, cognitive dissonance? Right. So that's uh, a big literature. I mean, the key thing about co the kind of dissonance literature is this idea that um, people try to kind of homogenize their beliefs, to bring them into line. So the idea is that people don't like it when they have two beliefs that kind of con con contrast with each other or inconsistent with each other. My view is that it, that's not the case, is that there's all kinds of inconsistent beliefs uh, lurking in people's heads all the time. Um, maybe they're living in this module, maybe they're living in this module. Of course, I'm using these metaphors just for, just for ease of kind of talking to you. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, my, my, my experience, and I think the data uh, support the view that under lots of circumstances, it's perfectly fine for people to have mutually inconsistent beliefs, thoughts, and ideas in their head. Um, and, and so there, I, I, I just, I would hesitate to put too much weight on the idea that people are relentlessly trying to sort of rationalize and make their beliefs systematically consistent with each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and that makes a good segue, I think, into the question of self-deception, because this notion, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was introduced into uh, things like sociobiology and evolutionary psychology by Robert Rivers, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps in the 70s, uh, and he really did put a lot of emphasis on this notion of self-deception, but uh, according to the views you've been exposing uh, during this interview, uh, how do you look at it? Yeah, so, right, so Bob Trivers, um, so he has a, a, a book out a few years ago, Folly of Fools, so any of your listeners who are interested in looking at his most recent um, views on that should, should take a look at the book, which is, uh, which is engaging. Uh, so, uh, he he expands the notion of self-deception further than I typically would want to go, but I do think that, you know, if you look at his early work, as you say, I think there was a nice piece in 1980, he comes to a similar conclusion to the one that I sort of, uh, sort of came to in, in our previous remarks, which is that, again, it's about deception. If I um, have a belief in my head that I'm great, smart, a good driver, what have you, then I can persuade other people that I'm that as well. And the, the trick, of course, that he kind of talks about, which I think quite right, is if you have a, a sort of a damaging belief about yourself, 
that's conscious, then that can leak out because you can illustrate to other people that you have that belief and that's bad for you for people to think things that are not good about yourself, about you as an individual. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think um, he and I have a similar view. There's a, there's a little bit of space between our positions because he wants to expand it uh, further than I do. In social psychology, a lot of the self-deception literature has a slightly different view too, which is that it's motivated so you feel good about yourself. The key difference there is my position is, you know, it might make you feel good to have a false belief, but typically the reason it's there has to do with the strategic advantage that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, about the, the, the fact that these things run subconsciously in our minds, when people think that perhaps we're sometimes or, or perhaps even most of the time making decisions on the basis of, of something that is subconscious and we're not really uh, using, uh, let's say, our rational minds to make decisions, they usually tend to associate this with some sort of irrationality. But since uh, these uh, cognitive systems are tuned into something that is part of the world that is outside and, are, and they are the result of adaptation, so of problems we had to solve in the real world, would you say that uh, it really makes sense to look at them as being uh, irrational, at least in the, sense, in the common sense that people use the word? Well, I think the best kind of approach to this really is Gerd Gigerenzer's work where he talks about ecological rationality. And as you're saying, you know, what you'd expect is for systems that are designed by natural selection, not always to be designed to distill truth, although the truth is usually helpful. And so there's no doubt about that. The truth is super helpful um, in figuring out what's true about the world, making inferences, behaving in a way that it's going to often lead to outcomes that you want to bring about. Um, but of course, there's other things, as, we, as we've been saying, ignorance, self-deception, so on. Um, and so that's going to make people look funny. Um, you know, e even a well-designed system uh, might not look like it's conforming to the, the sort of standard view of rationality. And then, of course, there's constraints, right? You just can't build a system. Like natural selection is a wonderful, amazing engineer. Um, but there's limits to natural selection as well. So there's always going to be limits on how... Uh, the system operates, and then a crucial part of this, of course, is trade-offs. You know, um, any system, a real one, has to operate in real time. And so there's going to always be some kind of trade-off between getting to a, the right answer and the speed with which you get to that answer. Um, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's a, a feature, a design feature of the system. It's, it's weird to call that a flaw to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think that a very interesting example that you also use in your book, even though it comes from other people's work as well, is when uh, that experiment where when people show other people um, squares with uh, that they seem that they have different shades, but they really don't due to different illumination conditions or something like that. And uh, people uh, aren't really able to look at them as having the same shade. It doesn't matter how much time they look at them, they still have different shades in our, or we still uh, process them as having different shades in our visual sy system. So, uh, for practical purposes, it's still important to perceive things like that, right? Even if in reality, they are not exactly like they seem. Yeah, I think that these optical illusions are a great example. So, you know, the visual system, when faced with these carefully constructed optical illusions, um, can be quote unquote fooled or give you the quote wrong answer. But what you're really looking at there is an incredibly well designed system, uh, which we can manipulate a little bit to, to, um, you know, look at the ways in which occasionally it gives kind of a, the wrong, the, the, the quote unquote wrong answer. Um, but that's the visual system doing exactly what it's designed to, to do, just under a particularly sort of interestingly vexing uh, circumstance that we've manipulated. Yeah, I think I think those those are great examples to to show how look even a beautiful system like the visual system is going to have to have constraints on it again because there's always going to be trade offs. There's always going to be something new in the environment um, that it's got to confront, uh, and and. They're also super fun to look at. So um, I, I love looking at those optical illusions. I, th I think they're super useful um, scientifically, but also just uh, just as entertainment as well.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been talking about how people uh, operate differently in different conditions when they are exposed to different things in their environment. And so they all the time have these cognitive, these subconscious cognitive processes operating in their mind and calculating trade-offs and sort of a equation of reward versus effort and things like that. So would you say that uh, those would be some of the underlying reasons why it is so difficult for people uh, to, for example, keep up with their resolutions and expectations? Yeah, super interesting question. So I sort of, I sort of think about this in a, a funny way. So, you know, I, when I think about these modules, I think that some of them are sort of impatient. So when you're super hungry, you just want to sort of eat anything that's around. And, um, and other modules are sort of more patient, like the system in your head that tells you that you should be going to the gym and you should work out and be healthy. Um, and so, you know, one way to think about those modular systems is that they have kind of different time frames for their, their goals or their motives or what have you. Um, and so, you know, the, the modular system that uh, wants to satisfy your hunger, you know, is going to cause you to, you know, wind up, you know, stuffing yourself at the buffet, even though your long term modules are saying, yeah, you know, we don't really want to gain weight. Um, and that, I think, is a super interesting area because what it suggests is that the different modules sort of win under different circumstances, right? So when you're hungry, the short term modules sort of wind up beating out the long term ones. And when you're not, the long term ones can sort of suppress the short term ones. And so the minds are, our minds are sort of these little fights between these modular systems, um, which is why we have to build worlds around us that, um, you know, can help us achieve these long term goals. So our short term modules aren't tempted. This is why I don't keep chocolate in the house. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because recently I've also been talking with some people that do work in life history, the with life history theory. And um, even from a rational perspective, doesn't it make sense, for example, that people that live in precarious conditions, for them to have their short term cognitive modules more active? Because, I mean, it would make sense for them uh, to um, to expand, let's say, the resources that they have available in the shortest time possible because, I mean, tomorrow they might not have access to them anymore, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Life history theory, I think researchers have gotten much more sophisticated about that idea recently, uh, well, recently, um, over, over, over time and have applied it in much more interesting ways. And absolutely. So you'd expect that organisms who can be in different environments, like such as humans, that, that the system would sort of be calibrated to the system that they're in. And yeah, so in, in places where there's a lot of uncertainty, um, then you sort of want to do everything today if it's available because there might not be a tomorrow and then in places where you know life is a little easier then maybe the system should be trained up to be a little bit more patient and um, you know I think one of the the real important innovations in evolutionary psychology is the increasing emphasis on life history theory on development on how adaptations get built over time um, from from um, the, the time of birth and so on and I think those are the kinds of those are the kinds of answers that are going to be super interesting about the calibration of these different modular systems. Mm -hmm. Yes. And do you think that all of these things that we've been talking about here today uh, might help us perhaps in the future und understand a bit better how personality works? Because, I mean, personality is one of those things that vary quite a lot among people and uh, there are people with different personalities and that's obvious people know this intuitu intuitively just by interacting with one another so would you say that perhaps in the future we might discover that personality works on the basis of for ex for instance uh, different modules being more or less tuned in a way or another, or more or less active in different people. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, in the literature, personality is that word is almost always heard right next to the term individual differences. Um, and so I think it's going to turn out to be easier to just to think about things in terms of individual differences instead of ca having all this baggage of whatever personality might mean. But absolutely, like it would be to, to me surprising if it weren't true that differences that emerge between members of the same species didn't emerge because they were 
you know, developing in different environments, um, especially for complicated organisms like humans. So I think a lot of those individual differences are going to come from, um, from these different modular systems being calibrated. Having said that, you know, you look at the personality literature and of course you've got all this heritability in there, right? So, um, to a certain extent, it's, it does look like it's going to be true that in most environments that humans are in, some of the differences between individuals are going to be due to differences uh, in genes. Uh, and then, you know, it could very well be that those those values change depending on the environments that we find ourselves in. And, and that's why that's a very difficult field because it's a moving target. I think that's that's always going to be, uh, a, you know, w one of the more complicated areas is because there's so much variation that can come from so many different places. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just perhaps a couple of questions about your second book, the, the, the Hidden Agenda of the Political Mind, which is also very interesting and where you apply this notion of the modularity of, of the human mind into politics. Uh, so could you please tell us about uh, how this is applied when we're dealing with uh, people's political interests uh, and particularly when they are part of, uh, of different political groups or even groups that then develop into perhaps political entities. Right. So, you know, politics is, uh, as, as of course everyone knows, is a tremendously complex issue. And so, you know, this is, we, we had to simplify a lot. So one of the things that we sort of wanted to, to point to was that we think many people's political opinions it, it plugs into the, what we were talking about earlier about how p people don't know what their motives are. So the theme of the book really is that people's political opinions, we think often, not always, but often derive from their self-interest. So people choose the political position that corresponds to what's sort of good for them. But then what they do is they make up a reason, not not in a malevolent sense. Their brain tells them, a, you know, gives them an, a, a, an argument that's more palatable than self-interest. And people claim that that is the origin of their political view. Um, and then the way it intersects with political parties is, of course, very complicated as well. So the political system we have here in the United States, a two-party two -party system, just two capitalist parties, is very different from the way it plays out in, with some of our European friends, uh, where you have these parliamentary systems with a greater variety of, of parties, um, in which people are more or less, first of all, associated with individuals who have similar interests, right? That's how these parties come about uh, originally. But then it's complicated because everyone's got a different basket of interests. So you wind up with these weird coalitions of people who are willing to compromise on this versus that issue. So, you know, uh, I mean, it's sort of tried to say that politics is complicated and it also leads to peculiar bedfellows. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that if it's true that people are sort of figuring out where their interests lie, developing their positions, and as long as these interests vary, you're going to have very strange political configurations, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's interesting because at a certain point in your book, you refer to certain other authors, like, for example, Steven Pinker, when they say that, oh, if you know that a particular person uh, is identifies as Republican or Democratic, now talking about the political, the binary political system in the US, of course, that we can uh, we can expect with a certain degree of probability to know what what polit what specific politics they favor or they favor but you have a different ap approach you say that basically the binary system that we have of liberals and conservatives or democrats and republicans and things like that or left and right isn't really that useful because it, it seems to me at least this was the idea that i got from your book that it's much it's much better for us to have an approach uh, of um, of trying to know where people fall in terms of each specific uh, uh, each specific policy that is for different policies they might have different opinions the and and those are connected with their personal and group interests right Right, um, exactly. So here I do want to just make sure that I give credit to my co-author on this, Jason Whedon. Um, this is this is an area that he's done some, I think, terrific work in uh, before before we started working together. And you know, ultimately, this is you know, like everything, it's a it's an empirical question, and it's also going to change over time. So you know, many of the data sets that that Jason and I looked at, and by that I mean most of Jason. 
what we find is that you can't necessarily predict one view from another, that it's true that people wind up coalescing into political parties because in the United States we have a two-party system, and so people have to choose one or the other more or less, and, and there are certain things which are going to correlate within that party. But if you look, our look at the data suggests that there's lots of cases in which um, you're not really able to predict one person, one view from another, another view, and that's because people within parties, they have different baskets of interests. Uh, and so they wind up being in the same party, but not exactly on the same page in terms of some of these issues. Um, now, again, I do want to emphasize this this can and has changed a little bit. So as you have seen party polarity uh, increase in the United States, um, so, some of these correlations have gone up. So now we're seeing a little bit more coordination of views than we might have seen uh, in prior data sets. So, you know, this is what's going to happen in politics is that people's people's views are going to change as as the context changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just perhaps the last question, could you please explain us how people use moral condemnation in politics? Because it seems to me, and this is the information that I got from your book as I interpreted it, is that so people have these personal interests and they, and they get to condemn morally other people that have the opposite interests when it comes to certain policies, because if they get uh, politically or legally instituted, let's say, uh, then the opposite of what favors them, then they wouldn't be able to uh, to have certain kinds of behaviors or or, have, or lead certain kinds of uh, lives, let's say, so something like that, correct? Yeah, so the way we view this is that, uh, right, so people have uh, moral views, which again correspond more or less to their self-interest, and much of that has to do with the way you want to live your life. So, um, you know, we feel like people justify their position based on, you know, a, a moral point of view, and that, that kind of language helps recruit other people to your cause. Um, and then, you know, once you have sort of a plausible moral position, it's possible to persuade other people to build legal systems that correspond uh, to that. Now, the, the example that Jason Whedon used to, to develop these ideas was abortion, um, where, you know, he takes a position that, you know, views moral positions on abortion are more or less smoke screens, if you will, um, for people having wanting laws that are going to allow them to live the life they lead, either one in which they can have an abortion if they need one, or one in which they can prevent other people uh, from having one because they, they want a particular kind of world in which monogamy is is a is a favored lifestyle because that's their that's their lifestyle. So absolutely. So the idea is that people are sort of using morality as a kind of persuasive tool and then a little stick to try to try to constrain other people's behavior. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because that would change perhaps the social dynamics or yes, the group in general. That's exactly right. I mean, again, when you have modern political systems, then moral views can really matter because the, the way that we build laws has to do with what what kinds of laws people morally can get behind. And then even if people have a different moral view, they're still constrained by it. And that's the key key point is that when we have rules that apply to everybody, a subset of people can make, make rules that are going to constrain or enable um, everybody's behavior as opposed to just theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, Dr. Kurzban, just before we go, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work online, and particularly now that you're out of uh, the University of Pennsylvania? Sure, I have a website, robkurzban.com. Um, I, I don't update it frequently, but I do try to kind of accumulate my work there. Um, and soon I'll be getting back to uh, getting some more writing done, and, and um, that'll be the place where I, where I uh, announce it first. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, can we expect a new book coming out in the near future or something like that? I'm working on a proposal right now, and I never want to promise because books notoriously take much longer than you expect. Uh, but certainly, you know, um, that's that's the plan. I think I got a couple more left in me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Kurzban, it has been really a very interesting conversation, and I would really like to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. 
I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.